Hello and welcome to jasonnewland.com My name is Jason Newland and this is Jason's Storytime Bedtime or Bedtime Storytime, one of them Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes and it's basically me telling you or reading stories most of them being very old and out of copyright sort of in the public domain so it's a case of me finding stuff uh, I found some quite large books but um, so like The Wizard of Oz is one that I'm going to be able to read and a few others and luckily we've got some cars in the background which is nice and so what I thought I'd do today I'm going to save this save, oh no 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 no, no. that's the wrong one add to reading list these are Japanese fairy tales compiled by Yi Theodora Ozaki Profusely illustrated by Japanese artists. Profusely. And it's 1908, this is from. And so what I thought I would do is read you. So it's Tokyo, 1908. And there's a few stories. But I thought I'd just read one to you today called... Uh, my Lord Bag of Rice. So there's nothing for you to do. I'm just going to read this short story. And you can just relax and let my voice send you to sleep. Now, I've not read this before, so I'm reading it for the first time, which is the same way as saying I've not read it before, but as it's Japanese, I mean it's not going to be in Japanese, I'm not going to try and read you, I wouldn't know how, but there'll be some, I can see there's some Japanese words that I may not pronounce in a way that uh, is correct. And I just want to assure you that in no way do I care. Uh, so I'm just letting you know that, you know, I'm not, I'll do my best, but I'm not bothered. You know, I'll just, I'll just read it as I see it. And uh, I think we'll all we'll all get through. It'll it'll be all right in the end. I think. So, so I didn't even know the Japanese had fairy tales. So this is quite cool. I know that the Japanese have got a very poetic, a lot of poetry in Japan. But uh, so this is ninety. Oh wait, and this is the, um, what was it, oh the learning to fly a plane, yeah, so the first okay, starts off, can I ask you a question please? The trainee's pilot said to the instructor, and the instructor said, Why is it? And the trainee pilot said to the instructor, asked him, How come you're not teaching us how to land? I oh, know it's a different foot map. No. So, this, this story is called My Lord Bag of Rice. Long, long ago. 
there lived in Japan a brave warrior known to all as Tawara Toda or my lord bag of rice. Can you imagine someone giving you a name? And you're old enough to ask what it means. Daddy? Yes, Tawara. What does, does my name have meaning? Because it was in school and some people said that their, their names they had meanings. And my friend Billy, this is before we we swapped sandwiches because I didn't want cheese because I had cheese yesterday and he he had a sausage roll and we swapped and then we went and played marbles and skipping and but then he said to me that we um uh, that his name had had meaning and he said he said to me what well, Billy this is but he said what did you what did you um well Jonathan also came along because he'd just been swimming and his hair was wet, but they didn't matter because it was sunny outside. And the teacher said that it shouldn't really matter because it's sunny outside and it's hot. And therefore, he shouldn't need to have to dry his hair. And um, and then Billy, I said to Billy, um, well, what did you say? And he said, why? Oh, yeah, the uh, the name, the name, or his, his, his name means something. And he said to me, Tawara, I said, yeah. He said, no, what, what does Tawara mean? What? And I said, no, no. What does Tawara Toda mean? I said, I don't, it's my name, isn't it? It's a way of communication. Uh, I, I hear it a lot, it just, it's, I don't, I don't know. Um, so I thought I'd ask you, Daddy. And then his dad said, oh, that's okay, son. It means my lord bag of rice. Oh, how thrilling. Lovely. You've named me a bag of rice. Okay. Sorry, I'm just scratching the uh, thing. Okay, anyway. His true name was Fujiwara Hideseto. And there is a very interesting story of how he came to change his name. Well, that makes me feel silly now because that wasn't actually his name, was it? Damn. Anyway, forget that. One day he sallied forth. I don't know what sallied means. Travelled, maybe. In search of adventures. For he had the nature of a warrior and could not bear to be idle. So he buckled on his two swords, took his huge bow much taller than himself in his hand and slinging his quiver it's hard to say the word quiver without quivering his quiver on his back started out he had not gone far when he came to the bridge of Sita no Karashi. Spanning one end of the beautiful lake Biwa. No sooner had he set foot on the bridge than he saw lying right across his path a huge Spur, uh, no, serpent dragon. 
its body was so big that it looked like a trunk of a large pine tree and it took up the whole width of the bridge. One of its huge claws rested on the parapet of one side of the bridge, while its tail lay right against the other. The monster seemed to be asleep, and as it breathed, fire and smoke came out of its nostrils. At first, Hidisetto could not help feeling alarmed at the sight of this horrible reptile lying in his path. For he must either turn back or walk right over its body. There are only two options. I definitely wouldn't want to walk over a dragon, would you? I'd turn back. Or a taxi or something. Hot air balloon would be a way to do it. He was a brave man, however, and putting aside all fear, went forward dauntlessly. Dauntlessly. There's another word for idiot. <laughs> Stupidly. Crunch. Crunch. He stepped now on the dragon's body. Maybe I should make a sound for that. That's crunch. Or if I was the one doing the walking. Ow! Ow! What are you doing on my body? Get off. He stepped now on the dragon's body, now between its coils, and without even one glance backwards, he went on his way. See, in some ways, you... I think the weirdest part of that story, the most unbelievable part, is the fact that he walked over it. Not the dragon part, just the fact that he walked over it. I'm not sure if I believe it. But, you know, that's cynical me, I guess. Okay, let's get on with the story. He had only gone a few steps when he heard someone calling him from behind. On turning back, he was much surprised to see that the monster dragon had entirely disappeared, and in its place was a strange-looking man, who was bowing most ceremoniously to the ground. His red hair streamed over his shoulders and was surmounted by a crown in the shape of a dragon's head and his sea green dress was patterned with shells. Hidesato knew at once that this was no ordinary immortal and he wondered much at the strange occurrence. Where had the dragon gone in such a short space of time? Or had it transformed itself 
into this man. And what did the whole thing mean? While these thoughts passed through his mind, he had come up to the man on the bridge and now addressed him. Was it you that called me just now? Yeah, it was I, answered the man. I have an earnest request to make to you. Do you think you can grant it to me? If it is my power to do so, I will, answered Hidesato. But first, tell me who you are. I am the Dragon King of the Lake, and my home is in these waters just under this bridge. And what is it that you have to ask of me? said Hidesato. I want you to kill my mortal enemy, the centipede, who lives on the mountain beyond. The dragon pointed to a high peak on the opposite shore of the lake. I have lived now for many years in this lake, and I have a, a large family of children and grandchildren. For some time past, we have lived in terror. For a monster centipede had discovered our home, and night after night it comes and carries off one of my family. I am powerless to save them. If it goes on much longer like this, not only shall I lose all of my family, but I must myself must fall a victim to the monster. I am therefore very unhappy, and in my extremities I decided to ask the help of a human being. For many days, with this intention, I have waited on the bridge in the shape of the horrible servant to the agony that you saw, in the hope that some strong, brave man will come along. But though they came along this way, as soon as they saw me, they were terrified and they ran away as fast as they could. You are the first man I have found able to look at me without fear. I knew at once that you were the man of great courage. I'll beg you to have pity upon me. Will you not help me in Kill my enemy, the Sapis and the Peter. Hidesato felt very sorry for the Dragon King on hearing his story and readily promised to do what he could to help him. The warrior asked where the centipede lived so that he might attack the creature at once. The Dragon King replied, that its home was on the mountain Mikami. But that it came every night at a certain hour to the palace of the lake. It would be better to wait till then. So Hidesato was conducted to the palace of the Dragon King under the bridge. Strange to say, 
as he followed his host downwards, the water parted to let them pass, and his clothes did not even feel damp as he passed through the flood. Never had Hidesato seen anything so beautiful as this palace built of white marble beneath the lake. He had often heard of the sea king's palace at the bottom of the sea, where all the servants and retainers were salt water fishes. But here was a magnificent building in the heart of Lake Biwa. The dainty goldfishes, red, red carp and silvery trout waited upon the dragon king and his guest. Hidesato was astonished at the feast that was spread for him. The dishes were crystallized lotus leaves and flowers, and the chopsticks were of the rarest ebony. And ivory lived together in perfect harmony. As soon as they sat down, the sliding doors opened, and ten lovely goldfish dancers came out. And behind them followed ten red carp musicians with the koto and the samison. Hmm. Getting a little bit too erotic, this is. Thus the hours flew by till midnight, and the beautiful music and dancing had banished all thoughts of the centipede. The dragon king was about to pledge the warrior in a fresh cup of wine, when the palace was suddenly shaken by a tramp tramp. Or, that's my impression of the sound of a tramp, uh, as if a mighty army had begin, began to march not far away. Hidesatu and his host both rose to their feet and rushed to the balcony and the warrior saw on the opposite mountain two great balls of glowing fire coming nearer and nearer. The dragon king stood by the warrior's side, trembling with fear. The centipede, the centipede, those two balls of fire are his eyes it is coming for its prey. Now is the time to kill it. Hidesato looked where his host pointed, and in the dim light of the starlit evening, behind the two balls of fire, he saw the long body of an enormous centipede winding around the mountains, and the light in its hundred feet glowed like so many distant lanterns, moving slowly towards the shore. Hidesato showed not the least sign of fear. He tried to calm the dragon king. Don't be afraid. I, I, I shall, I shall surely k k kill the centipede. This, bring, bring me my bow and arrows. 
<laughs> the Dragon King did as he was bid, and the warrior noticed that he had only three arrows left in his river. He took the bow and fitted an arrow to the notch, took careful aim and let fly. The arrow hit the centipede right in the middle of its head. But instead of penetrating, it glanced off harmless and fell to the ground. Nothing daunted Hidesato. Took another arrow. Fitted it to the notch of the bow and let fly. Again the arrow hit the mark. It struck the centipede right in the middle of its head, only to glance off and fall to the ground. The centipede was invulnerable to weapons. When the dragon king saw that even this brave warrior's arrows were powerless to kill the centipede, he lost heart and began to tremble with fear. The warrior saw that he had now only one arrow left in his cool river, and if this one failed, he could not kill the centipede. He looked across the waters. The huge reptile has wound its horrible body seven times round the mountain and would soon come down the lake. Seven times. It's a bit specific, isn't it? Nearer and nearer gleamed fireballs of eyes and light of its hundred feet began to throw reflections in the still water. Then suddenly, the warrior remembered that he had heard that human saliva was deadly to centipedes. Really? But this was no ordinary centipede. This was so monstrous that even to think of a such a creature made one creep with horror. Hidesata decided to try his last chance. Sweet. Got as much. <laughs> she gobbed it, you know. So taking his last arrow and first putting the end of it in his mouth. Ugh. He fitted the notch to his bow, took careful aim once more and let fly. This time the arrow hit the centipede right in the middle of its head. But instead of glancing off harmlessly as before, it stuck home to the creature's brain. Then with a convulsive shudder of a serpentine, his body stopped moving, and the fiery light of its great eyes and a hundred feet darkened to a dull glare like the sunset of a stormy day, and then went out to blackness. A great darkness now overspread the heavens. The thunder rolled and lightning flashed and the wind roared in fury, and it seemed as if the world were coming to an end. Then he realised it was just a storm, and it happens often, you know. Had the Dragon King and his children and retainers all crouched in different parts of the palace, frightened to death, for the building was shaken to its foundations. At last the dreadful night was over, day dawned beautiful and clear, the centipede was gone from the mountain. Then Hidesato called to the dragon king 
to come out with him on the balcony. For the centipede was dead and he had nothing more to fear. Then all the inhabitants of the palace came out and with joy and Hidesato pointed to the lake. There lay the body of the dead centipede floating on the water, which was dyed red with its blood. You asleep yet? Happy dreams. The gratitude of the Dragon King knew no bounds. The whole family came and bowed down before the warrior, calling him their preserver and the bravest warrior in all Japan. Another feast was prepared, more sumptuous than the first. All kinds of fish prepared in every imaginable way. Raw, stewed, boiled and roasted, served on coral trays and crystal dishes were put before him and the wine was the best that Hideo Sato had ever tasted in his life. To add to the beauty of everything, the sunshine shone brightly. The lake glistened like a liquid diamond, and the palace was a thousand times more beautiful than by day. His host tried to persuade the warrior to stay a few days, but Hidesato insisted on going home, saying that he had now finished what he had come to do and must return. The Dragon King and his family were all very sorry to have him leave so soon, but since he would go, they begged him to accept a few small presents. So they said, in token of their gratitude to him for delivering them forever from the horrible enemy, the centipede. As the warrior stood in the porch taking leave, train of fish was suddenly transformed into a retinue of men, all wearing ceremonial robes and dragon's crowns on their head to show that they were servants of the great dragon king. The presents that they carried were as follows. First a large bronzed bell, second a bag of rice, third a roll of silk, fourth a cooking pot, and fifth a bell. Uh, Nintendo would have been pretty better, wouldn't it? Yeah. Hidesato did not want to accept all these presents, but as a dragon king existed, he could not well refuse. A lot of stuff to carry as well, isn't it? Dragon King himself accompanied the warrior as far as the bridge and then took leave of him with many bows, bows and good wishes, leaving the procession of servants to accompany Hidesato to his house with his presence. Oh, so he got some help, so that's good. The warrior's household and servants had been very much concerned when they found that he did not return the night before. He's got servants. But they finally concluded that he had been kept by the violent storm and had taken shelter somewhere. 
When his servants on the watch for his return caught sight of him, they called to everyone that he was approaching, and a whole household turned out to meet him, wondering much what the retinue of men bearing presents and banners that followed him would mean. As soon as the Dragon King's retainers had put down the presents, they vanished. Hidesato told all that had happened to him. The presents which he had received from the grateful Dragon King were found to be of magic power. The bell only was ordinary, and as Hidesato had no use for it, he presented it to the temple nearby, where it was hung up and boomed out the hour of day over this surrounding neighbourhood. This single bag of rice, however, was much was taken. Much was taken from it, day after day, for the meals of the night in his whole family. Never grew less. The supply in the bag was inexhaustible. Just like the boringness within my brain. Inexhaustible boringness. The roll of silk too never grew shorter. Though time after time long pieces were cut off to make the warrior a new suit of clothes to go to the courts in at the new year. The cooking pot was wonderful too. No matter what was put in it, it cooked deliciously. Whatever was wanted without any firing. So didn't have to lay anyone off. Truly a very economical sauce pan. The fame of Hidesoto's fortune spread far and wide. And as there was no need for him to spend money on rice or silk or firing, he became very rich and prosperous and was henceforth known as My Lord Bag of Rice. The end.